Welcome to Backstory, the musical journey of Leon and Malia. Award-winning duo Leon and Malia has been part of Hawaii's music scene for over 40 years, composing and performing a wide range of music in Hawaii and around the world. In this special series, we'll be hearing the fascinating backstories behind their amazing journeys in music from Waikiki to the London Symphony. From the momentous triumphs of Hokulea to the Hawaiian cultural renaissance. Aloha, I'm Leon Siu, part of the musical duo Leon and Malia. And today I'm going to be talking about our, my own backstory. And that is uh, before I met Malia and before we became a team, a musical team. And so my backstory starts back on the Big Island. I was actually born in Hilo, but my family at the time lived in Miloli'i, which is a small fishing village uh, in South Kona, and some of you may have heard of it. And Miloli'i was where I ha had my early childhood. Um, but we also had a home in a place called Na'alehu, which is a plantation town in Kau. Uh, and so I spent my young childhood there as well. And eventually, we moved, uh, around 1955 or 56, we moved to Hilo. And uh, there in Hilo, um, I started attending school, elementary school in particular. And uh, it was really quite a, a nice time and quite a neighborhood we had in uh, the Waikel Homesteads area of Hilo. Uh, that particular el elementary school was quite uh, peculiar because it actually had a very robust music uh, program, particularly a program in ukulele. And I would venture to say about 70% of the student body of Waikia Waina Elementary School played ukulele. And so I grew up uh, playing ukulele uh, from a very young age. Everybody started uh, actual ukulele lessons at around seven years old. Years old. And that uh, led me into loving music, and particularly Hawaiian music, because we played a lot of Hawaiian songs, even though we also played a lot of uh, kind of American songs, Stars and Stripes Forever and things like that. But uh, it was a really good introduction, and it was a very, very um, wonderful um, situation in that we all played together, so there were, you know, it was everybody did it, the whole neighborhood, all the kids in the neighborhood played ukulele. So we had a, a, quite a wonderful upbringing that way. My parents also thought that I should have art lessons, and so <clears throat> when I was seven, I started art lessons as well under a very uh, famous painter, a Chinese painter uh, who lived in New York and uh, lived, uh, had, had his career in New York. And so um, <clears throat> he had moved to Hilo, and I had started classes with him from when I was seven. Uh, and I painted continually all through my life, really, or up through, through college. Um, <clears throat> so I had these two loves in my life. I, I had music and painting, and I followed both of those tracks all through my career and through my life. Um, <clears throat> in uh, at the Hilo High School, where I attended, um, we ha of course, I, took, I was in the band as well and continued in music in that way, but I was also, of course, continuing with various art lessons um, with different teachers and learning different um, media um, in painting and in drawing and things like that. Uh, eventually, I went to the University of Hawaii in Hilo, and I enrolled there. I had choices to go elsewhere, but I decided to enroll there because there was a particular gentleman who was uh, an artist in residence. He had only come in for a couple of years uh, in order to fill in for the art director or the, the, chair, the head of the art department in Hilo who had taken a sabbatical. So uh, the, the painter who came in to take, take his place, his name was John Thomas. And so he was quite a, a well-known artist and um, I decided I wanted to stay and learn painting from him. And I'm very glad I did because I learned quite a bit more than simply painting, I learned a lot about uh, art philosophy and, and about different um, uh, philosophies of his that uh, led to uh, something he calls structural equivalence, which is something that actually is pervasive through all of, the, of creation. Uh, and this is that the, everything is built in, in a structure, in a grid, and that these grids actually assist or, or provide a pattern or a, uh, a structure from which you can hang 
uh, whatever art or whatever um, creation that you're doing, including music, dance, all of that actually conform to a grid. The grid is kind of invisible, but it's there. Um, so I started painting uh, under John Thomas and getting quite serious in that area. Um, and when John Thomas left the Big Island and went back to San Francisco, the area where he comes from, um, I continued painting um, in Hilo um, for another year while I was atten attending the university there. And actually I took over his painting studio, which was the transom hall of an old hotel. So I had the top floor with a skylight and, and a big wall where I could hang my work and paint. And so I had the studio of my own. And from there, actually, I sold a number of paintings to different collections around the world. Um, and uh, so that was going on. But at the same time, I was also playing music. So uh, around the time when I entered the university, um, I also started playing music on the side. I played at this place called the Islander Nightclub, which was a very, very um, uh, popular nightclub in, in Hilo. And it was a place where a lot of visiting artists would come, particularly Hawaiian musicians. So while I was playing there, I met a lot of uh, visiting artists like Eddie Kamai, Tony B, uh, Sonny Chillingsworth. Uh, and then also a lot of other musicians from Hilo used to hang around there at the Islander nightclub. Uh, people like George Naope and, and Edith Kanakaole, although she wasn't really at the nightclub, but she was one of the musicians that I became very familiar with. And she's actually an old family friend. She and my mom go back quite a ways. So um, uh, in working or, or doing my things in Hilo, I was, of, of course, uh, quite inspired by the place where I was growing up because the Hawaiian culture, of course, was quite rich growing up in Milo'li'i as well as um, in Na'alehu, which was more of a plantation town, but still there was a strong identity with, with Hawaii and with uh, Hawaiian language and with um, Hawaiian music and Hawaiian arts. And in, Na in uh, Waikia Hawaiian School, of course, we played a lot of Hawaiian music. And then growing up and uh, playing at the Islander nightclub, uh, there was a lot of Hawaiian music being played there. The interesting thing is, however, that I was actually working in uh, or playing at that time. My interest was in folk music. So I bought a lot of folk records, and it was during the, per the period of time of uh, the Kingston Trio and Peter, Paul, and Mary and those. And so I began to learn guitar in the folk style. I had started learning earlier uh, slack key guitar uh, because my grandma had given me her guitar when I was about 10. And so it was tuned to slack key, so that's how I started playing guitar. Slack key. But then later I became more interested in folk music, and so I started learning all kinds of folk styles. And in doing so, I, um, I became uh, pretty proficient at it, and I met up with the several of my friends from high school, and we started playing folk music, uh, a lot of folk music. And we spent a lot of time playing. I would spend maybe two, three hours a day just playing my guitar and, and learning different songs from different records. Um, and uh, so that was my background, and when I was playing at the Islander nightclub, I was playing a variation of Hawaiian and folk music. Um, then um, after my second year at college at the University of Hawaii in, in Hilo, uh, it was only a two-year university at the time, or two-year uh, program at the time, and so I had to move to uh, Manoa. And so I moved to Manoa, and I got into the uh, painting class in Manoa. Um, all of my prerequisites were waived, and I, I, became, I went into the um, uh, master's painting class. And it was quite an interesting situation because several of us were, were hand-chosen to, to just do painting. And, and so we were assigned a place in, um, in Manoa Valley, a house that they ha the university had acquired from one of its, its botany teachers from uh, uh, n another generation before. Um, and the man's name was Dr. A.G. And A.G., this place is called A.G. House, and it was on the way up to Manoa Falls. And it was a Swiss chalet that he had imported from Switzerland, board by board, and they reconstructed it here in Manoa Valley. Uh, if you are interested uh, in knowing what it looked like, if you ever watch Rap, Raplinger's um, uh, Raps Hawaii, 
program, uh, you see the old man who's talking story, and, and he's, he's the, the host of the program, and he's in front of AG House, which is where I had my studio. So, in fact, he's right under the window where my studio was. Some of the other people who were there with me um, in, in this master's painting class was um, uh, uh, David Farmer, who later became uh, the head of the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, uh, and um, Eric Enos, who now is the head of uh, uh, oh, the farms. <laughs> anyway, uh, Eric Enos, uh, and uh, the father of Solomon Enos, uh, the great painter. So um, uh, anyway, so I, I was at the University of Hawaii, and I was playing music at the same time on the side. My friend Thor Wold, who had been my, one of my partners in playing music during high school, uh, had also moved to Oahu to attend Manoa, the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And uh, so we played music on the side, and we would play all kinds of things. We'd go to jam sessions and play here and there, and then eventually got some gigs playing. Um, but a lot of times I just moved around as a soloist, and I went to different um, nightclubs and just sat in and played and jam sessions and things like that. So. Uh, Thor and I did some concerts, and then we, at one time, we, we moved into Waikiki, or we had a gig in Waikiki, and that was at a place called Amin's uh, Restaurant, or Amin's Coffee House, I think it was called, and um, it was right at the triangle, or at the division, the split of the road between um, uh, Kuhio Avenue and Kalakaua. Um, and right, right there, right today, was where the King Kalakaua statue stands, but that was a nightclub at one time. And um, so we played there, um, and that was my introduction to Waikiki, and I started playing in other places in Waikiki. Um, Waikiki at that period of time was really quite an interesting place because there were musicians all over the place. So there was a lot of live music at the time, um, and I would um, just go down the street and sort of sit in or watch some of the live musicians playing. Sometimes I would sit in and other times, you know, I would just um, just kind of enjoy what they were doing. And there were pe people playing in Waikiki at the time, uh, you know, all kinds of Hawaiian musicians playing there. Um, so it was really quite an interesting time. Now during that time also, I, I forgot to mention, when I first moved to Waikiki, um, I, it was in 1966. No, excuse me, 1968. Um, and uh, I was walking down the street and uh, met up with a group of people who were uh, just kind of sitting under a palm tree in front of the Royal Hawaiian uh, Shopping Center at the time. It wasn't the big monstrosity it is now, just kind of a low-rise low uh, strip mall kind of a place. Um, anyway, so some people were sitting there, and I sat down with them and started playing my guitar. And um, one of them invited me to stay with at their place, uh, which is right there in Waikiki. Um, and then a few days later, we were asked to go to a party down at the end of Waikiki, at the end of Kalakaua Avenue, at the foot of Diamond Head. Um, and there, I ran into another musician, and his name is Liko Martin. And Liko and I became very good friends at that time. So uh, we started playing music together, and uh, along with Thor, who had moved there by that time. Um, and then uh, we had a house up in Palolo Valley where Liko would come and hang out and we'd play music. And then we moved to Mauna Lani Heights, um, and uh, we had a house full of musicians who were playing music all the time. And Liko hung out there quite a bit. And in fact, several of his more popular songs were written there, like uh, Nana Kuli Blues, which became known as Waimanalo Blues. Um, and uh, so we were kind of a little group of, of musicians playing music and, and going out and jamming and just having uh, just a lot, a good learning time and a good relationship building time. We were also getting involved with what later became the sovereignty movement, but at that time was simply us um, protesting and, and um, you know, uh, trying to save parts of our, our culture and parts of our land. Uh, so uh, Liko and I would be called on to uh, play at various um, sit-ins and demonstrations and, uh, and concerts to raise interest. So Waiholi Waikani, of course, and then there was uh, the Santos uh, uh, farm out in um, Kalama Valley. Um, later, um, it was um, Protect Kaho'olawe. Uh, all of the 
these issues started to come about. At, at that time, um, of course, by that time I had met Malia, so that, that's for another period of time. But anyway, going back to uh, 1968 and playing in Waikiki, um, by 1969 I started playing at a place called uh, The Pieces of Eight. Uh, and I played there for several months, and then I was uh, asked to play across the street at a place called Chuck's Cellar. And Chuck's Cellar was a very, very, um, it was a steakhouse, or actually a prime rib house. And it, we, uh, we used to, uh, I used to play there in the evenings. I'd start at 10 o'clock and, and go on through the evening until about 2 or 3 in the morning. Um, and then, uh, but before me, from, I think, from 6 to 10 or something like that, um, Jay Laren, uh, the piano player, used to play there, and the composer, of course. And uh, so we go back quite a ways as well. Um, at the same time that I was playing at Chuck Cellar, there were also, like I was saying, lots of Hawaiian music being played all around Waikiki. Um, and uh, that's when uh, so Melvin Lead was at Gauguin's, and uh, Emma Viri and um, Ed Kenny were at the Halekulani Hotel. Um, and there were just there was music all over the place. There was a place called the Beef and Grog, which is where the Royal Hawaiian Shopping Center is now. And the Beef and Grog had all kinds of live music. Across the street was a place called the Cox Roost, and there was uh, uh, live music there in the International Marketplace. Uh, there's live music there. Um, so it was music, and all the hotels had live music. Um, in fact, a guy named Animal Keale was playing at the Waikiki Biltmore, and Animal Keale is, now you know him as Mo Keale, uh, but uh, back then everybody called him Animal. But uh, he was this ukulele player with a fa fantastic voice, and, and so we got to know each other back then. Um, so it was quite an interesting time there in, in Waikiki. So what I, I wanted to, to discuss, not so much the, the, um, the uh, chronological or the, the historical um, order of things, but really about what was going on at the time. And like I said, folk music was really quite strong when I was growing up, and particularly in my high school and college years. Um, and there were many, many uh, uh, things that were going on during that time as well. And of course, one of the biggest things was the Vietnam War. And it w there was the, uh, and the, the anti-war movement. Um, and, uh, and of course, in the, in the 1960s, there was also uh, the uh, flower power movement and, and all of those types of uh, things going on in which uh, it really changed society into being something a little bit more reflective about uh, political things as well as cultural things that were going on. And so the counterculture movement was very strong in the, in the 60s and moved on into the 70s as well. So during that period of time, uh, music was going through a huge transition from folk music and, and this idea of social responsibility and, uh, and this idea of, of peace and of, of uh, making sure that we can live in harmony together. Th those are the major themes of the folk musicians of uh, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and, and Peter, Paul, and Mary and Kingston Trio and um, so many, many others. Uh, during that period of time, I, I was quite strongly influenced by the folk music uh, scene as well as what was going on. In 1964, I actually made a trip to New York and, and got to witness myself, uh, still a teenager, but I got to witness uh, some of the things that were going on there uh, in, in the folk uh, music, uh, uh, the hub of folk music at the time, which was New York City. And later I got to meet some of the stars, uh, those that were creating the music. Um, there was one particular gentleman that not too many people know about. His name is Phil Oakes. And Phil was one of the protest writers at the time. Uh, very, very uh, wonderful writer. And if you Google him, you'll find a lot of his songs. And he, along with Dylan, uh, Bob Dylan, were really the major um, composers and bards of the, that period of time. So I got to know Phil Oakes, and we got to be friends. And later, uh, when he moved to uh, Los Angeles, I spent a little bit more time with him uh, there in Los Angeles. Uh, by that time, Malia and I were singing together. Um, and, but uh, anyway, so in, in the period of uh, the 60s, 
folk music again was very strong. And of course, rock music began to become quite popular as well. So um, these were not popular, but it became, became uh, it, it moved to a whole new level uh, of, of rock music, and, and it just changed music altogether. Uh, and then there was the, the melding of folk and rock in, in uh, groups like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, um, and uh, so many others that I uh, uh, can't even name. Uh, but these types of uh, things that were going on at the time were so significant and I, I found out that it, that was what really influenced me in, in the later years, or influenced me throughout my life, was this involvement in this idea of social responsibility and the idea of, of um, roots, of having uh, roots in that uh, it is we need to remember where we came from uh, in order to know where we're going. Um, and this, of course, has become a, a big theme in in the movement of the independence movement of Hawaii. Um, and one of the things that occurred during that period of time in the early 70s was, of course, the Hawaiian Renaissance, so the late 60s, early 70s. So I was right there at the time when Hawaiian music was beginning to move into a whole new phase, uh, influenced very strongly by folk music and, of course, by rock and uh, the, the things that were going on around the world. Um, <clears throat> The University of Hawaii at the time uh, was uh, a hub of, of the protest movement as well. It's kind of like looking back at the occupation of Bachman Hall uh, recently. I was remembering uh, the occupation back in the 60s of Bachman Hall, and that time it was in protest to the Vietnam War, and how so many of the musicians, folk musicians as well as other musicians, were quite engrossed in providing time and, and leadership and attention and support for uh, what was going on. And my own philosophy was not so much, um, uh, you know, anti-American. It was really anti-war and, and trying to see, can't we find a different way to settle our disputes? Um, and so that's my, my roots are in that period of time of of trying to look deeper and trying to search out where, uh, where we, can, we as musicians, as artists, can make a difference. And so it was a very inspiring time for me because lots of musicians were, were responding to that call. Um, and so that influenced the music we were, Malia and I were to write later uh, quite, quite a bit, and as well as the ar art background that I had. In, in understanding that the role of the musician, like the role of the artist, is really one as a prophetic role. In other words, <coughs> we, it, we image things for the future. We say, this is where we want to go to, this is where things ought to be. And we actually help to set a vision for those who come after us and for those around us at the time and saying that these injustices, these wrongs, and, and even the complacency needs to be challenged and, and they need to be moved forward in a way that would make a better world. So even though these things sound so altruistic, they actually are, are the way that things um, actually function. That is, the artist paves the way ahead of the politicians and, and everybody else. The artist paves the way of setting the vision for the society. And in doing so, we, we actually help as artists to form the future um, and, and to make uh, the, that vision uh, take on a form of reality. So you set the vision and then the vision becomes more embraced by the society and the society as a whole becomes um, you know, uh, bettered by, by what you've done. So, I am uh, really glad to have this time to be able to share with you about uh, my background. Again, um, coming from a little village in South Kona called Milolii, um, I, the other part of me is that I, I became quite um, involved in, in cultural things as well, particularly with canoes. Um, and uh, my grandfather was a canoe builder, and in fact, um, recently, there was a canoe that was built in Milolii by my grandfather 
um, uh, that was refurbished and is now uh, sitting on the beach at, there at Miloli. It's called Malolo. My grandfather built that canoe along with some other of his friends uh, in Miloli'i in 1932. My mother at that time was seven years old when the canoe was launched. And the canoe actually had a very profound influence uh, in the future. Now, uh, again, um, I'm a canoe person from the standpoint that, that I see canoes as uh, how our forefathers saw them, that there are modes of transportation as well as uh, of livelihood that you need canoes to fish from. And so um, my grandfather built fishing canoes, but there was this one time, 1932, he and friends built a racing canoe. And that racing canoe became influential in that it started to dominate the races. So um, in the early, I think it was in the 50s or so, uh, or I th maybe in the 60s, the canoe was, was acquired by a uh, canoe club here on Oahu, and a mold was made from that uh, canoe. And that mold became the fiberglass form for many of the canoes that, uh, that were used since then. So my background is, is toward canoes. And one, one thing I did want to say about canoes, so when most people think about canoes, they think about racing canoes. Those are a fairly new invention. But the canoes of our forefathers were voyaging canoes, and of course they were practical canoes or fishing canoes. They were canoes for transporting to get from place to place, and also there were war canoes. And so um, the, when we think about canoes, we need to think about the entire scope and, and how that had a major uh, profound effect on our entire culture. Um, uh, as well as many, many other aspects of our culture. So I'm going to leave it at there because I'm getting a bit far for, uh, apart. But just to say that my background in, from the fishing village in Miloli'i is tied into canoes and, and into music and into art. So mahalo nui loa. Thank you so much for having me uh, share this time with you. Mahalo. Aloha. Mahalo for watching this segment of Backstory, the musical journey of Leon and Malia. I was able to share my part of the story previous to Leon and Malia, and next month we're going to have Malia sharing her part of the story previous to Leon and Malia. So stick around. Next month will be the episode with Malia sharing her backstory. Aloha.